Yesterday we, uh, we did the Bhutan march through uh, uh, spectroscopy and all those things. Uh, I'm assuming now you know all about it. And uh, now today we're going to talk about two spectroscopic diagnostic techniques which rely upon those things we talked about last time. And then we'll end the day by talking about lasers. And, uh, and then we go have this dinner, whatever this dinner is. So let's talk about absorption. So I'm going to talk about uh, what they call direct absorption or line of sight absorption. That's the one that is the simplest to describe, sort of the most obvious. Then I want to talk about wavelength modulated absorption and then cavity enhanced techniques and then a little bit about tomography because uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities in absorption still for uh, you know, interesting ways to use it and, and get good results. So this is a repeat from the first lecture, but it's uh, absorption is a resonant technique, so we have to use spectroscopy. It's a line of sight technique, which is one of its down one of its weaknesses. It goes all the way across the flame, so it's path integrated. Uh, mostly we use continuous wave lasers, but we can use pulse lasers, and I'll talk about a case called cavity ring down spectroscopy in a while. It's a linear technique. The signal scales with the irradiance. You can do this in the infrared. Uh, we haven't really talked about infrared spectroscopy so much, but uh, the fundamental vibrational bands of molecules have really strong cross sections. They respond very strongly. And so if you can find a laser that'll hit those, uh, those lines, uh, you can get very strong signals. So you can also do it in the visible. Mostly it's done in the infrared and the ultraviolet. Often it's done uh, with narrow bandwidth lasers, but you can do uh, broad bandwidth uh, techniques. And it's fully quantitative if you apply it properly. So I showed you this picture before. We're going to take a tunable laser beam and pass it across the flame. And that laser beam is going to be attenuated by absorption. So we want to know how much of it's attenuated. So we split a little bit off. And we measure this I0. I0 meaning before it goes through the absorber. Then we measure IL over here because that's uh, the irradiance after it passed a, a distance L through the absorber. We just ratio those two to get the transmission through the flame. So we pass a tunable laser at some frequency, nu sub L for laser. We want it to be resonant with the uh, transition, and we pass it across the flow. So we look at the fractional reduction in beam irradiance. And, and this is actually, I suppose it's something I should have talked about before, but this background here is actually sometimes useful. That allows you to normalize things. For example, let's imagine the flame is heavily sooting and everything is scattering all over the place. It doesn't really matter much if you get a good uh, absorption signal because this baseline will, will go down because of the soot, but if you have the baseline, you know how much it was decreased by the soot, and then this gives you the fractional absorption again. So having the baseline is not a bad thing. So we scan the laser across that line and we see it reduced in intensity because part, it's partly absorbed and it has a line width as we talked about yesterday. And we use Beer's Law to extract the number density from this expression here, uh, which as I've said before assumes we have a homogeneous mixture of absorbers across the line of sight. So NM, that's, uh, this is slightly different because now I've, I've called it NM, that's the number density of absorbers in the absorbing level, and we were using M yesterday for the ground level, right? So that's why I used M this time. Uh, sigma uh, is the absorption cross-section, and L is the path length through the flame. So it's a direct experimental detection of transmission. Uh, if you're not using an established technique, as in established known spectroscopy and so forth, uh, you do need to model the absorption spectrum under the appropriate conditions. And we talked yesterday about uh, this uh, program called HITRAN, which certainly at room temperature has uh, pretty good information. But even HITRAN is limited if you're going after an oddball molecule. So you should certainly start by searching the literature and seeing who's done stuff. Sometimes you'll find, like for water, for example, you'll find a huge amount of work that's been done that's very good. And you can follow some of the prescriptions that people have already written. CO, CO2, things like that. There's no need to go do a complete spectroscopic search of the literature because it's been done. But others, you should do that. So you need to, you need to find out who's done that under appropriate conditions, pressure and temperature, 
decide if you can achieve the detectivity you need, temperature sensitivity if you're measuring temperature, or temperature insensitivity if you're uh, not measuring temperature, and so forth. For example, you may be going after carbon monoxide, but you're going to end up doing it at really high pressures. Well, you should sit down and model it because the pressure broadening it might kill your signal unless you sit and think about exactly where to go spectrally. This issue of uh, temperature sensitivity or insensitivity, um, that's important. Um, you, what you can do is just uh, take the derivative of the absorption signal with respect to, J, to the J lines, right? You, you have those energy levels that uh, tell you that fun are a function of J. You can minimize the temperature sensitivity, say, uh, by looking at how they change, how, how do those lines change uh, how am I trying to say this? Do they change rapidly with temperature or not? Right? You can choose a J line that will give you uh, rapid temperature change, a couple of J lines, or you can find a place where it's fairly temperature insensitive. Another thing that people do is if they're looking at a flame that has cold boundary layers, they will choose a line that's, that it does not have a population at, in the cold boundary layer, but is only populated in the hot core of the flame so that they can ignore the cold boundary layer. So those are the kind of thinking, that's the kind of thinking you have to go through when you think about which line am I going to look at. It all depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Notice that this N is what you're trying to measure, but what you're actually measuring is NM. So if we, if we just look at uh, uh, statistical mechanics, this is what you really wanted, this is what you measured, you just have to invert that to get at what you're trying to measure. So these things you're going to need, like uh, degeneracies, partition functions, all that stuff, you can find usually in the you can find usually in the literature. And if you're following an established technique, just grab a few of the comprehensive papers and see if they agree with each other, and sort of follow the prescription. The spectral absorption cross section is how I like to look at things. It's written this way. Uh, sometimes you can grab the Einstein coefficients. That's actually kind of an interesting point. Uh, lift base mostly has Einstein coefficients. Hytran has uh, line strengths and things like that. Uh, you can convert back and forth, but if you go to lift base, you can actually go straight to a uh, cross section with the uh, Einstein coefficients they give you. Often uh, the, the lower state is much more populated than the upper state. That's usually the case, and you can just write it this way instead. If you can't find the Einstein coefficient, you can find other things. And we talked about how you convert back and forth, where there's an entire chapter in my book talking about how do you do that. That's actually what started me working on the book. That chapter, I wanted to like publish that chapter as a, uh, as a review article. And uh, one of the reviewers of the article didn't like my paper. So I decided, OK, forget that. I'll make a book. <laughs> uh, the line shape function is uh, modeled with a Voigt profile, usually. Uh, and that's actually, that's something I skipped over yesterday. There are different uh, processes that can affect line shape functions we did not talk about. There are, for example, uh, phenomena at higher pressures that can actually cause the line to get narrowed again. And so if you're, if you're operating under unusual circumstances and you are unable to fit the uh, line, with uh, a void profile, start to plot the residuals and then look at, is there structure to the residuals? That will give you a clue that there's something happening in the structure of this line that you haven't modeled correctly because the residuals will have a very clear pattern to them and that will tell you perhaps that you need to include narrowing, for example. And you can, you can find the expressions for how to handle that as well. But it, you know, in room, uh, room pressure air at a normal flame temperature, this is usually all you need. So usually what you can find in the literature is this uh, A that's in the Voigt expression, right? You can, cal you can calculate the Doppler width just using the formula that I gave you. Uh, and it's located in several locations in the formula for the Voigt profile. Then you just need measurements of the uh, um, dephasing rate um, so that you can get a, uh, if you can't find that anywhere, then you can measure it as we talked about before.
and you just have to be careful how you've measured it and there are lots of examples in the lit literature about how you do that kind of measurement. So then you're going to need the absorption path length and that's actually not so trivial. If you have an open flame you can always, uh, like let's, if that flame is uh, rotationally symmetric, you know, you can, if, you're, if your laser is passing across, you can just translate it get that way and get a feeling for what the flame looks like, or rotate it and translate it, get a feeling for what the flame looks like, and figure out what your path length is. But in the, in the boundary layer of the flame, there will be different uh, populations of the level that you're looking at and so that's a case especially where you might want to choose a line that's, that's, that's going to have no population at the temperatures of the boundary layers. You want, the, you want the thing to fall quickly at the edge of the flame. Or if it's an open flame you can always take a Schlieren image. You can try to find tricks like that but actually uh, there will be a little bit of uncertainty about that. What, is that, what exactly is L. If it's a contained flow, like inside a shock tube, well, it's the diameter of the shock tube. It has windows right up to the edge of the shock tube, and there it is. So it all depends on what you're looking at. So often it's not easy to get a good value for L. So you just do the best you can, and then there's, there's, that's an uncertainty that has to be folded into the other measurement uncertainties. It seems kind of silly that after all of this, it's not so easy to measure L, but uh, you know, so that's like PIV, the hard part's getting particles in the flow, actually. So when you do this correctly, uh, it's a line of sight uh, approach, but, uh, and it only applies to a homogeneous medium, but it's, uh, it's a fairly good technique. But I'm warning you a little bit about making measurements in non-homogeneous media. There are people who do this. Uh, it's done moderately regularly and, and I, don't, I don't actually understand how useful the data is. Uh, sometimes for example you'll see people doing it in a piston engine. If it's, a, if it's an HCCI engine which is supposed to be homogeneous across the uh, path length, okay, maybe that's okay, but if not then you, it's difficult to understand how to interpret the signal because there are two problems here. This n total that you're trying to measure that's going to be changed by chemistry across the path length if you're not looking at a homogeneous mixture. Okay, so we may, let's say we're looking at something that's partially premixed or, or non-premixed. It, it will be something like this, right? N will change across this path length, but it'll be changing by chemistry. The problem is this ratio that you need to use is also changing, and it's changing in a non-linear way because of temperature. And you don't know which was which because this thing was path integrated, it went all the way across and all those things are folded together in a way that's a little difficult, you, you can't extract the two from each other. So I don't, I don't uh, suggest uh, looking at a flame that looks like this, uh, was passing a laser beam across it because you won't be able to figure out exactly how to interpret that and for example if you're trying to look at two lines for temperature then again you're going to have concentrations changing all over the place spatially and the temperature is going to be varying strongly so the Boltzmann, you know, you're actually going to try to choose two lines that change quite a bit with temperature now you're going from cold to super hot to, to moderately hot to, to super hot to cold again it's going to be doing this and so you're going to get some sort of non-linearly averaged signal and, and it won't be possible I think to figure out how to interpret that If you use it in an appropriate experiment, it's an absolute determination of number density and that's, that's unusual and it's an extremely valuable thing. If you combine two resonances, as I discussed before, you can use uh, Boltzmann statistics uh, to get the temperature. So here's an example from uh, Stanford where we're looking at absorption versus frequency. Here's two different lines and you see how they change with temperature. That's a, that's a nice switch and that'll give you a nice uh, resolved measurement of temperature looking at the populations of the two lines. So let's talk a little bit about experimental difficulties in more detail than before. Absorption techniques, let's, most of them use uh, diode lasers so let's talk about that for now. You tune those by scanning the current. Why is that? Because that actually changes the laser cavity length. Last lecture is going to talk about lasers and mode structure in lasers and cavity length, so keep that in mind if, if that made no sense to you and I hope by the end of the day it will make sense. 
Unfortunately, that also changes the laser power. So you get this sort of vertical scan with the laser power, okay? And there's a large amount of amplitude noise. I talked about that before. Your detector is staring straight into these oscillations, these fluctuations in the beam. And this is, uh, this is actually a cruel cartoon I drew that's not that bad, but uh, the point is that there's a lot of amplitude fluctuations that can mask an absorption profile as you're scanning. So direct absorption, straight across into a detector and nothing more, has a high detection limit. You cannot measure super low concentrations with it because of that. Is there an advantage to using dye lasers over diode lasers? Um, the, um, by dye laser, are you talking about a continuous wave laser or a, a pulse laser? Most, most of the ones you buy nowadays are pulsed. Um, we'll talk about injection seeding in the third lecture, but uh, if, you, if you don't have an injection seeded laser, there's a huge amount of amplitude noise, and that will, that will end up causing a huge amount of amplitude noise in, the, in the, la the dye laser and out to the frequency converter, so that'll be pretty noisy. Uh, people typically don't do absorption with a pulsed system like that, um, but when I did a PhD, I actually did uh, absorption using a dye laser that was a continuous wave and single frequency and scanned, and that was really fairly quiet. And it was scanned using a different mechanism, and because it was single frequency like that, it was fairly quiet. So that actually was probably better. That was in the ultraviolet looking at OH. Uh, That's what I was talking about. That's what I used. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ring, it was a ring dye laser. The, 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 dye, the, the mode in a ring dye laser circulates in a figure eight like that, and it ends up going single frequency. And it's, it's, they don't make them anymore, and I don't know why, but uh, they were really very, uh, they had high performance. They were, they were a, a kind of a pain because they took a lot of alignment and so forth. But. I think it's called this R2 missing a best kind of laser. Okay. Apparently, somebody still makes them. So this is laser amplitude noise I'm showing you here. So this is the amplitude as a function of frequency. Okay, so this is in hertz. So that's 10 hertz right there up to a mega, 10 megahertz, all right? And what you're looking at here, number one, which is that gray curve, that's an argon ion laser. Probably none of you have used those. Those are the old fashioned kind, the big ones with the continuous green beam that came out. Uh, number two is a diode pump solid state laser. That's this one here. Okay, uh, three is the shot noise limit. Okay, are you all familiar with the shot noise limit? It's given by uh, uh, photon statistics or Poisson statistics. What happens is when light hits a photo detector, there will be some fluctuation in the, in the signal generation. Uh, and and that, it follows Poisson statistics. And, and when you're using a detector like that, you're sort of stuck. The detector is going to force that kind of noise on you. So when you're working on an instrument, what you'd really like to do is get everything down to the shot noise limit. Often there's noise that's above that limit, and the, a lot of times there's nothing you can do about it. But the shot noise limit is kind of uh, where you'd really like to be able to get your entire instrument to because you're not going to be able to do better than that. So uh, four is the photo detector noise floor, and then five is the measurement system noise floor. So those are, that's electronic stuff there. So you take this, you take this kind of uh, spectrum with, a, with an RF spectrum analyzer. You can buy these things. They look like an oscilloscope, but they obviously give you a different looking plot. So what we're looking at here is noise, OK? So zero in frequency is what the CW laser DC would look like, OK? And then we have this technical noise. It's falling away slowly with frequency. They call it 1 over F noise or pink noise because it, uh, it's more red than it is blue, so maybe it's pink. That's why they call it that. There's noise, you see these noise humps in the argon laser? I, I used to do, when I worked at spectrophysics, the very first thing I did was study noise in the, coming out of the new product that they had just developed. And uh, I know from experience that these big humps are most, I don't know whose laser that is, but the big humps are most likely turbulence in the cooling water around the plasma tube. It gets, the thing gets really hot, and so they have this water rushing through there, and it's, 
probably turbulence causing that. And you see that the diode pump laser, which does not require that kind of cooling to the head, uh, is a quieter laser. Th these are in dB, so that's a huge difference between those. Diode lasers themselves, the kind that you do uh, uh, spectroscopy with, are quieter than this. But it's this kind of noise, this 1 over F noise, is what's going to uh, limit uh, direct absorption. When I made that cruel cartoon showing these oscillations, this is what I was talking about. It, it has to do with a lot of things, uh, fluctuations in the, in, within the formation of the laser beam and so forth. In fact, uh, now this is an extreme example, but uh, if you have uh, an argon laser running here, say, and you open up the, uh, they used to have uh, uh, beam tubes around them with nitrogen going through because, if, because the argon laser would, would form uh, ozone out of the oxygen in the air, the, the intracavity beam would, and then that would absorb the intracavity beam, which made a lot of noise. So they actually had a, a system for protecting everything from uh, oxygen. But anyway, if you open that up and just wave your hand, you see this noise go all over the place. There, you can make a huge amount of noise because it's a coherent source, and so these things will beat with each other. And if they fluctuate in frequency, they'll just make massive beating noise. So because of this, any laser is going to have some of this kind of noise. And so for direct absorption, the minimum fractional absorption is on the order of uh, 0.05. You know, how much will it dip down, and, and you can still see it. So an approach to reaching lower detection limits is to try to avoid the laser noise. And often you can do that by modulating the laser amplitude at high frequencies. In the old days, uh, before people got more clever, we used to do this. You, you just put this thing called a chopper in the beam. It looked like a, a, a thin disk with holes in it, and it would go really fast. So it would, it would modulate the beam, uh, the amplitude of the beam. And you would try to drive it out to higher frequencies, because the farther you go, the quieter it gets. And then we would use a lock-in amplifier, and, and in a crude sense, let's say, I'm, let's say I'm modulating, let's say that's a signal I'm actually measuring and I'm modulating at that, at that frequency. What a lock-in amplifier does is it samples that frequency. You, you give it a reference saying, go seek that frequency, and it has a very narrow uh, band pass to it, so it won't allow stuff on either side, okay? And it, we can talk about how it works later on if you want to, but that's basically what it does. So you can do that, and it will improve the signal-to-noise ratio. But I think a better way to do it is, uh, is called wavelength modulation spectroscopy. And there's another technique called frequency modulation spectroscopy. They are, they're almost exactly the same thing. The difference is that when you do FM spectroscopy, you're modulating it at such a high frequency that the laser swings outside the absorption band of the molecule, whereas wavelengths, it never swings that far out. So we're going to swing the laser frequency back and forth when we do this. That's why it's called wavelength or frequency modulation spectroscopy. So they can get much better fractional absorption. They're, it's a much more sensitive technique. It's still line of sight, OK? And the experiment looks almost exactly like direct absorption but the signal processing is completely different. As I said before, the diode laser wavelength is controlled by temperature. And the, what you do is you put this thing on a thermoelectric cooler, and that sort of sets the nominal temperature of the system. Okay, And then you sweep the current through the chip, and that does fine tuning. So you can scan back and forth across the absorption line uh, doing that with a, with a current ramp. And as I said before, that causes the laser power to scan, and that can introduce some noise even. So I want to show you a technique that uh, came from Stanford, uh, which I thought was a pretty clever technique. It was done by a, a PhD student there named Chris Goldenstein. Anybody know Chris? Yeah? <laughs> uh, so think about this. Um, he came up with a clever idea. He, d he did nice work. I liked it. I was the chair of the Gordon Research Conference on Laser Diagnostics in Combustion last uh, summer. I invited him to give, come and give a talk. Well, that looks great on your resume that you, you, that you got that. And, and now it's being presented to you all in, in this class. So if you do cool stuff, look where it goes. Of course, the most important thing is, can you get a job? <laughs> he got a job at Purdue. So do good work. It, it goes places. <laughs> 
So I'm going to tell you that uh, this was a clever idea. And, and I, don't, I don't think Chris would mind if I repeated this. Even, he even said this at the Gordon Conference. He said something about, uh, I'm not so smart as other people. I got buried in all this uh, Fourier series stuff and decided this is dumb. I can't handle this. And he sat and looked at it and thought, wait, why are we doing this? And he had this flash of genius, right? So I, I like this technique, so I'll show it to you. So f for wavelength modulation spectroscopy, we have to add extra current signal. And so we're going to modulate the wavelength using a sine wave in addition to the slower ramp scan. So we're going to do two things at once to the wavelength of this laser. We're going to slowly scan across the absorption profile, OK? And we're also going to modulate at high frequency the, the wavelength of the laser, but much less. So this modulation will sweep the wavelength a much smaller amount than the long sweep, OK? So to try to keep these two straight, I'm going to call it a scan. That's the one that goes all the way across the line. Okay, and, and uh, the modulation is the one that's small, that's higher speed. And you can see, here's the modulation at FM and the scan at FS. Okay, and those two are going to drive this diode laser, going to go through the target gas, and then there's a, a measurement system over here that's not just a little red box. So we're going to follow their notation so we can keep all this straight. Frequ scanning frequency is SF, modulation frequency is FM, and they're both in units of hertz. So there's a lot of frequencies we're going to talk about, so let's define what they all are so people won't get one confused with the next. There's an optical frequency, right? That's the laser beam. Okay, that's the one we're going to actually tune over to the resonance. That's the color of the light coming out of the laser, and usually denoted in, uh, uh, by frequency in hertz or uh, wave numbers. That's really high frequency, right? Because that's light. OK, so that's, we're going to be changing that. But we're going to do two things. We're going to scan that. We're going to scan this new at a frequency FS, which is this long <laughs> ramp. That's uh, quite low by comparison, you know, on the order of tens of hertz, say. It depends on what you're trying to do. Then the modulation frequency, OK, that's a signal frequency. These two are signal frequencies where that's an optical frequency. Uh, FM is a signal frequency. It's meant to avoid the 1 over F laser noise, so it should be in the range of 10 kilohertz out into the megahertz if you can do that. And the modulation signal is imposed on the diode current. So the laser output includes a sinusoidal optical frequency sweep as the current is modulated. And so we're going to talk about a maximum sweep. This is for the modulation signal, OK? That's how much we're going we're to do it really quickly. And the, so the, the, as we're slowly scanning, the modulation is going to sweep from this to that and back at this higher frequency. So those things are all sort of built into this signal. So here's a representation. This is measured, actually, of the laser output power going into a fairly high-speed photo detector, right? So you can see it ramping down. That's because that's the sweep. And as I said, the sweep is going to change the laser power. That's all that is. By doing that, we're actually changing the laser power. We're sweeping the wavelength as well, but it changes the laser power. And then this is the modulation, this really high speed stuff. OK? So in this case, in this particular case, the this, this scan was at about 25 hertz, fairly slow, with an amplitude of 2 volts. And the modulation frequency was 10 kilohertz with a much smaller amplitude. The goal is not to modulate the power. The goal is to modulate the laser output wavelength, but uh, this is what you're stuck with. OK, if we take that laser beam, exactly that same beam, and we send it through a Fabry Perot etalon, this is an extremely narrow bandwidth filter. And so what it'll do is it'll pass orders of the filter. So what will happen is if you hit exactly one of the orders of the Fabry Perot, the laser beam will come through. And then if you, if you change the wavelength slightly, it won't pass anything. It'll just stop passing light. And then when you get to the next order, it'll pass light. But it's very narrow bandwidth, so you see these little dots? Each one of those dots is the light coming through the Fabry Perot. So it's a way to monitor what's the wavelength, how is the wavelength sweeping with the light. So you can see that it's sweeping quite rapidly, and, and actually it's quite clean. This is a really nice, clean sweep. This is experimental data. 
So that's what we're, what we're looking at here is th this is that sweep that I was just talking about. It's common to define a dimensionless frequency. I don't know why we're picking on x so much, but nu over nu one half, where nu one half is half the full width half maximum of the absorption line profile, okay? So people who do this tend to talk about frequencies in a normalized sense like that. I don't know why they chose one half of the full width half maximum. So the dimensionless modulated frequency is just xm, which is, which is that. So that's kind of the magnitude of our modulation. If we express the instantaneous uh, laser frequency this way, using the same definition of x, and now we're, this is our modulation, and if x is, a, is a, an expression for the Beer's Law absorption function, including the line shapes and everything else, detector signal and so on, you, you get this model, a very simple model for the detector signal, although x is the thing that's complicated and the thing that drove Chris crazy. As it turns out, this S, we're not going to go there because it's pages, can be expressed uh, in terms of a sequence of the harmonics of FM. It's a series solution. And as it turns out, the measured absorption shape for the nth harmonic of FM is proportional to the nth derivative. So sometimes you'll hear this called derivative spectroscopy instead. So in other words, we're going to look at harmonics of the modulation frequency, and each one of those harmonics looks like the derivative of the Voigt profile. So the second harmonic, when we sweep the frequency and look at the second harmonic signal, it will look like the second derivative of the Voigt profile, and so on. It, it works out that way in the math. So that might be hard to accept. Let's talk a little bit about what's really happening. So here's DC sitting over here, okay? Um, this is the, the sweep signal, right? It's, it's, in fact, uh, I stuck that about where it really was. That, and this is, these are in decades. This is a logarithmic scale, okay? That's very slow. In, compared to everything else, that's extremely slow. Over here is the modulation frequency, okay? And like I said, when you're doing a phase-sensitive detection, you set a detection bandwidth. You control that. And so that's the detection bandwidth. So over in this band, the, the electronics, sometimes you use a locking amplifier to do this, and at that point, the electronics that are sensing this thing are only sensing that. It's like AC coupling on an oscilloscope. Anybody, do you guys still, do you still use oscilloscopes? Okay. I like oscilloscopes with knobs and a trigger button and everything. But uh, when you AC couple, you can see this thing doing all this stuff. You don't see the DC, do you? You have no idea what the DC is, right? That's what's happening here. The locking amplifier has no idea what the DC is. This thing is really DC compared to that, and it's slowly changing. So the two processes are separated by a big frequency difference. So when you're doing phase sensitive detection, we're, we're just going to separate out what's at FM, basically. You have to be a little careful about the detection bandwidth, and we won't go there, but just let, follow along with this argument. So because FS is so slow, it's as though we're, we're doing all kinds of FM processing and we get it complete before FS moves along. So here's my little cartoon to think about. Here's the sweep. We're going to sweep back and forth across the absorption line, right? And here's FM changing by just delta nu M, okay? It's doing that really fast, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take this thing and we're going to start up here and we're going we're to be jittering it. We're going to move it along slowly in a relative sense. So this sweep is going to take this little arrow pair and move it along. But remember, the electronics that are sensing the arrow pair are only observing what happens at high frequencies. So when you think about this, think about this here. So there's really nothing happening here. If you, if you AC coupled this, you'd see nothing. It would look flat, right? That's what's happening to this part of the sensing circuits. It looks flat. It looks flat there also. It does not look flat there. You're going to see the signal jittering up and down, right? Because this thing in frequency is going across the Voigt profile. Okay? And it's not going to look like a clean sinusoid because it's going to contain all the elements of the Voigt profile in the different frequency, in the different harmonics 
of FM. So the signal is going to be oscillating. You're going to pick that up on your lock-in amplifier. If you look at the various Fourier components, you'll see the derivatives we mentioned before. So that's my cartoony way of describing it instead of going through all the math. And this is what they look like. So here's the absorptivity at uh, uh, frequency zero. This is just the scan, right? This is the 1 over 1F signal. That's the derivative of that curve. Here's the 2F signal, 3F, and so on. So the old-fashioned technique was to use a locking amplifier and demodulate at one of the harmonics while the ramp was scanned. They used to use 2F because actually there was a button on a locking amplifier that said 2F. There wasn't one for 3F or 4F, so people just did 2F, right? So, so what happened was you had, a, you, had a, a, you had this thing going at FM and you had a slow scan, all right? So, so you trigger the scope or your data acquisition with the slow scan and you go, and then the, the detector signal goes into the lock-in amplifier. You've got it set on 2F, and what comes out as you slow scan is this. And so then people had to model that, and that was where you got into all kinds of uh, Fourier series and pages upon pages of things. The approach is not problem-free. You have to develop a complex model, including all of the laser, laser spectral properties. And you had to pull in a concentration out of that. And people actually started to calibrate this. It, it is way more sensitive than uh, direct absorption, but calibration is kind of like going backwards. That's not a good idea. But it was too much of a pain uh, to, do, uh, to do the rest of it. The scan and modulation processes can cause intensity to change, and you can get some amplitude modulated noise. The other thing is, um, you have to be very careful not to accidentally have an etalon. And actually, I, I didn't put that into my uh, laser talk, but I should talk about that. It's unbelievable how whenever you're using a coherent light source, you can accidentally get etalons. Just, just a couple of parallel faces, okay? And you'll end up with etalons, and sometimes you won't notice them. But it's amazing how many times people come to me and say, I don't understand this, and I'll, and I'll just say, that's an etalon and they'll say, I don't understand why. Even if you anti-reflection coat a flat interface, that anti-reflection coating is for the irradiance, not the electric field, okay? It goes as uh, electric field strength squared to make the irradiance. So something that's actually anti-reflection coated for irradiance is still moderate re moderately reflective for the electric field. And etaloning, it's an interference process, is based on the electric field. So these things can be plagued by etaloning in, in all kinds of places. Anytime you go straight into a flat face, if there's another flat face somewhere, it can get confused and start making decisions about frequencies because you'll get interference patterns. So the, hand, the group at Stanford, it's really it was Chris's idea, Chris Goldenstein, has a new approach. And what they do is they say, okay, forget the lock-in amplifier. They capture the entire signal. They store everything on a lab computer, and they do the signal processing on a lab computer, which means they don't have to worry about the fact that there's only a 2F knob. You can do many Fs. So let's go through the entire process, uh, one step at a time. So the, their measurement involves passing a scanned and modulated beam through the sample, and they measure the irradiance on the other side. So they call it this, where that means measured, and that means transmitted, okay? So that's the irradiance at the photodetector. That's the measurement. That's the thing that goes through the flame or something like that, okay? So this with the M and the T is the measurement. They also uh, measure what the laser's putting out, okay? So it's, this is measured without being transmitted, okay? And what they do is they go through uh, a Fabry-Perot etalon and they get that scan I showed you. So they actually record the actual wavelength sweep and modulation of the laser. They record the real thing that produced the absorption profile. So that's what they're doing here. They're detecting laser frequency as a function of time, okay? And they store that. And that red curve I showed you was that. Now, what they, they know they're measuring something. They, they did water. 
Okay, so they can use HITRAN and all the best broadening data they can find and everything, and they can synthesize the spectrum. What do they think the spectrum is going to look like, okay, using all this data that you can get? So this is, not a, this is not new. I mean, with the other technique, the older technique, you had to measure, you had to, mod, uh, you had to synthesize the spectrum also. So it's not a new requirement. So then they, then they send that measured frequency versus time through their uh, modeled absorption spectrum, and they get this. So basically, they're synthesizing what they think the transmitted signal ought to look like. So that's what this stands for, synthesized transmitted signal, or simulated, I guess. So they have those two things to compare to each other, OK? So they use a digital locking amplifier software inside the, uh, the computer, and they look at all the harmonics, well, a lot of the harmonics, not all of them. They also normalize it by the center of the, of the 1F curve, which if there's some amplitude variation in the laser, this will make it go away. So by normalizing by that, that makes the, uh, the slow amplitude variations go away. And then they compare the two, and they adjust in a nonlinear fitting routine until they get the appropriate number density and temperature. And so here are some results in water. Uh, the blue lines are measurements, the red lines are simulations, and the, the greens down here are residuals. And this is for 2F, 3F, 4F, 5F, and 6F. And, and by using that many uh, different harmonics of F, uh, of F sub M, they get, they get way better uh, results. So I think this is, this is a really, uh, this is a good, if I were doing uh, wavelength modulation spectroscopy, this is how I would do it. Questions about that? Hmm. I'm sorry, say that again? Oh, it, does it drift over, does the modulation depth of the, of FM drift over time? Um, I don't think so, but, you know, I've never done this myself. It, you know, when you, when you, uh, the frequency itself and the amplitudes, I think you can get fairly cleanly. You can use a crystal oscillator to synthesize the frequencies, and that'll be extremely stable. Then if you have stable electronics, I think probably it doesn't drift very much. But, but the, I, I'm not sure that even matters, though, because every time you take a measurement, you're actually measuring the real laser spectrum in sweep. So even if it drifts around, you're actually going to acquire... I don't, think it would I don't think it drifts very much, but I'm not sure it would matter. Other questions? Yeah. You'd see that, and, and once you've recorded it, I'm sorry, with the Edelon would record the uh, drift, and that's, that's what I was getting at, is that every, t every single sweep you'd have what actually did go through the flame. So that's what you'd really want to use. Okay, uh, how's the Edelon set up to give you such good resolution? Um, have you ever looked at what a, how an Edelon works? Okay. Uh, it's in, if you go, that optical book I talked about called, by Hecht, H-E-C-H-T, they talk about how etalons work. It's, you ever studied electrical engineering? It's, it's a, it, for optics, it's what an electrical engineer would call a resonant tank. We're going to talk about uh, Fabry-Perot's, uh, when we talk about lasers, actually, but the way a Fabry-Perot works is it's two flat plates of glass, very flat, okay? And then they put a, they put a reflective coating on the inside here and they send light in. The light bounces back and forth, and uh, this is really a, a, a boundary value problem. In fact, the, the, to get really good uh, resolution, the, um, the coatings on, on the, reflect, the reflective coatings have to be extremely high reflectivity. And I had a friend who insisted this can't work because if this has got high reflectivity, everything bounces back and that's it, it's over. But this is a, this is a, a boundary value problem. What happens is, you get an electric field that builds up inside here, okay? And, it, and it, when you analyze this, if you look at the boundary condition right there, what you'll find is when this thing becomes what an electrical engineer would call a resonant tank, it feeds the information forward. 
you, you're, it will not be like a high reflector. At the, so the point of a Heb Fabre Perot is it's not just a high reflector, it's two put here with a space in between and it resonates. So it will now accept light. So, and, and, but that's, that doesn't mean energy is not conserved. When this, when, when this is exactly right and you get exactly the correct boundary conditions, right, then it will feed light into it. When it's not at exactly the right boundary conditions, it's reflected backwards. So it's a, it's a very narrow band pass filter is how it works. Uh, and so there's two kinds actually. There's a, there's a thing called a scanning Fabry Perot where you get this thing, with, these are mounted on piezos and they scan. So let's say we used to use this to look at the spectral properties of the laser. You send the laser beam in, you scan and you get a transmission and you can see. What they were using is one that's fixed, very, very stable with temperature and now you change the wavelength of the laser and for part of the time it doesn't transmit and for part of the time it does and that's what those dots were right but the treatment for that that whole that whole solution where you talk about how do the electric fields affect each other at the boundary of the of the high reflector that's in hex book Uh, does, that, uh, does that affect your signal to noise? Does it have problems with uh, this method? Um, you mean the other etalons I was talking about? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, well, sometimes if you, have, uh, if, you, if you have a laser that's very sensitive, if you accidentally get an etalon in front of it, that will feed back into the laser, and the laser will get confused about which mirror it's supposed to be using. That will cause a huge amount of noise in the laser. You'll see it immediately. Uh, otherwise, those etalons I was talking about will just cause problems in the spectral signatures here. So if you accident, let's say you're going to go into a cell that has uh, flat windows, right? If you accidentally cause an etalon and now you're going to look at absorption over here, you'll get a funny looking spectral signature because of that. And actually that's something else I should talk about in case you're not familiar with that. Uh, also in Heck's book, uh, when, you, when they work out the uh, the, there's, there's a section in Heck's book where he talks about reflection formulas, the Fresnel reflection formulas, okay? Then he works out this thing called Brewster's Angle. And there's a statue of Brewster on my campus. Brewster's Angle, if you ever looked inside an argon laser, say a, a plasma driven laser, a gas phase laser, you'll see these windows on the plasma tube that are at an angle like that, right? That's called Brewster's Angle. And what Brewster realized after working out the Fresnel formulas was that if I send light in here that's vertically polarized that way, there is an angle at which the reflectivity of this interface goes to zero, okay, for polarization in this direction. And not for polarization in the other direction. Polarization in this direction will be re rejected by that. So at a, and it changes with wavelength. So if you have a cell where you're trying to do these kind of experiments, you should, you should put Brewster's windows on that so you'll never get, you will never get etaloning. Okay? So if you think you're going to get, if you, if, you actually, if you absolutely have to have a window and you think you're getting etaloning, put a Brewster window in instead and, and that'll fix that problem. Other questions? Okay, cavity enhanced techniques. Well, if we look at Beer's Law, you could crank up the signal, and you crank up the signal by making L big. So we tried to make noise go away with wavelength modulation. With cavity enhanced techniques, we just make L monstrous. So we can get L on the order of tens of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers, depending on how we make this thing. So here's a picture of how we used to do it in my lab in Colorado. We used a pulse source. You can do a CW technique also, which I'll mention at the end. You have these mirrors. You're going you're gonna to put the uh, thing you want to measure inside some mirrors, okay? And they are very high reflectivity, and I'll talk about why later on. So what happens is you send a pulse in here, and it bounces back and forth quite a bit, okay? Because this is highly reflective, and it, but it slowly leaks out, and so the signal you get, this is a photomultiplier tube signal, so when it hits it goes down, and then it slowly comes back as the light leaks out, okay, with time. It's a time-based measurement. You can tune this pulse laser to uh, an absorption line, and what you'll see is a difference in the decay time based on that. So 
Actually, this technique was originally developed to measure the reflectivity of mirrors. And they would, they would watch the energy decay from inside a cavity made out of two of the mirrors they were trying to measure. But when you think about it, if, the, if you have high reflectivity, then this thing's going to bang around inside there for a long time, and that's how you get this really long path length for absorption measurements. So if, you, so if you have something that, let's imagine you pulled the flame out, you'd get a, a long ring downtime, you put the flame in there, now it's going to lose energy faster because of absorption, right? So you're going to get a faster ring down. One of the things that I like about this technique is, is that m most combustion labs have a tunable pulse system. You can just get two mirrors and suddenly you're in the business of cavity ring down. And uh, I'll show you an example where we calibrated LIF using uh, cavity ring down, and it's very easy. Let's say you're doing this flame here, right? Just put the mirrors in there, do the cavity ring down. You're, you're doing LIF at the same time, right? And, and, but the cavity ring down is an absolute measurement. It is absorption, though, so it's line of sight. So here's an, here's an experimental ring down time. So it's just signal versus time. And what's nice about this is, you're actually measuring a decay time, not, you're not worrying about staring into a noisy thingy because what you're looking at is a decay. You're making a time-based measurement, not an amplitude measurement. And you fit a single exponential to it, and you get fairly good results. You try to make the main loss in the cavity the absorption you're looking for, which is why the mirrors are so high reflecting. Now that causes a problem, which I'll talk about later on. So there are some people I've talked to recently who purposely made the, the mirrors a little bit more transmitting than people typically talk about, and I'll, I'll mention that. But usually the conventional wisdom is get the highest reflectivity you can get for high sensitivity. Here's the problem. You have to be very careful because uh, if you don't, uh, if, you're looking at thick, if you're looking at strong absorption, you'll go optically thick very quickly because we're talking about you know, kilometers of path length. So actually, you can accidentally go into an optically thick regime without even realizing it because this has got such a long path length. That's why some people have started now to use more transmissive uh, optics. It's an extremely sensitive technique. In fact, two of my papers have nothing to do with uh, uh, combustion. Uh, one of them was to measure uh, very, very small particulate, particulate on the order of uh, 20 nanometers in the atmosphere. And it was because uh, some guy who was a, a petroleum expert thought that when lightning struck the ground, if there was oil down below, there would be these tiny little anthracite particles in the atmosphere. So we actually made a cavity ring down cavity with a nitrogen laser in the cavity in this thing that we actually flew behind a helicopter, and this thing kept working. And they went looking for, uh, they were <laughs> flying around during uh, uh, lightning strikes. It didn't work. So we, we, we published this thing about the particles. And you wouldn't believe how many citations I have because it turns out that's important in the, the climate world. Who would have guessed? So you don't have to look at spectroscopy. You can look at other things with ring down because it is very sensitive. This technique does not work well in the presence of steep index gradients, okay? Because if you go near a flame front, the index gradient of the flame front will steer the beam to the edge of the mirrors, and you'll start to lose energy by diffraction, and that'll just kill the measurement. So I did a, I did a paper, if you're interested in this kind of thing, and we did a paper a long time ago where we, we used an electromagnetics code to model the modes inside this cavity and, and find the most stable situation that you could imagine, and then analyze how bad is it if you put a live lens inside the cavity, like a flame, how far can you push this? So if you ever need advice on how to size the mirrors and where to put them in to make a stable system, uh, go look at that paper. But it it's can be a, very, a serious problem. Well, because the light uh, uh, has fixed speed, we can write Beer's Law in terms of time instead of distance. Uh, you'll just have to accept this for now. It's uh, the time over a tau, okay? And this tau is, tau is a characteristic decay time given by this. The length of the cavity, or, or I'm sorry, that's the absorption length, not the cav... Uh, well, I should mix this up. That, that should be the absorption length, that should be the cavity length, sorry. So L is the cavity length, R is the mirror reflectivity, N is the number you're looking for. This is the extinction, which could be scattering, Rayleigh scat... You have to worry about Rayleigh because this is a huge long path and it'll actually start to contribute to the... Uh, absorption measurement, and then absorption. 
<clears throat> Usually you take two measurements, one with the laser tuned off resonance, so you get the decay without, off, we call it tau off, and then tau on when you tune on resonance. And so the number density that you're seeking in that lever that you're pumping is given by this. Yeah, here I was better. LA is the absorption path length in, you know, like I was showing this picture of the flame inside the cavity. Capital L is the cavity length, little l is the length in the flame where you're actually getting absorption. I was a little bit sloppy in that last equation. I apologize, I should have noticed that I had, I should have used the little l in that one. This one here should be the little l. So you do uh, tau on and tau off and you get this result. And you get very good fractional absorption, similar to wavelength modulation spectroscopy with this big blundering pulsed laser. Here are some examples from, uh, this is an example from my laboratory in Colorado. We were, we were developing this as an atmospheric sensor for dioxins and furans, but we also looked at mercury in the air. And uh, so this, is, this looks kind of crappy and messy, but actually there are a lot of mercury lines right next to each other and they're broadened, and so that actually is the mercury spectrum uh, in this uh, wavelength region. It's around 253 nanometers. So the, the, the dots are the measurement with cavity ring tone spectroscopy of mercury in the laboratory. The, uh, these black dotted lines are the uncertainties, and the gray lines are a spectral model uh, of mercury with those concentrations. So you see we were looking at, oh, those are just ring down times. But we were down, th this, uh, this uncertainty made it possible for us to see down to a half a part per trillion of mercury, which that seems like pretty good, right? Well, mercury is a, is a metal, and, and the atomic metals have incredibly strong cross-sections, so that's part of the reason why it was that sensitive. This, this is another one that gets a lot of uh, citations because it matters to the atmospheric world. Here's OH in a flame. This does not look so good. That's, uh, the red is a, a simulation using lift-based data, and then the, the black stuff is the measurements with uncertainties on there. And you can see already, that's not good. It's optically thick. So these are lines in the zero, zero band. They're strong, and you've got a problem. You can see down here in the weaker lines, we're doing better. So it works best to integrate the cavity ring down signal across the absorption line so you're not worrying so much about line width approximations and so forth. You improve the signal to noise ratio that way. And you have to go for a weak line. There's the integrated signal. Uh, so the question, I think, are, you're asking about the line width of the dye laser, or the, the amplitude noise, or? Yeah, because uh, the pulse dye laser, there should be some mode change of that, of that dye laser between pulses, right? Yeah. And if you want to swipe the pulse uh, Okay, so, so the question has to do with the pulse-to-pulse -pulse instabilities in the dye laser, which do happen, um, and do they affect this measurement? And that's the beauty of this measurement. Yes, that thing was doing this. We're just looking at uh, a ring down time, and we're looking at single pulses. So maybe, uh, this, maybe after we tune to a little bit to the side, we got slight, maybe that pulse has slightly different irradiance, right? But as long as the bandwidth didn't change much, and it doesn't really, and not in a dial, you get a lot of this kind of stuff, but you don't get much change in bandwidth, then, then you're gonna get a, a ring down time that represents what you're looking for. Because, so you're not looking at amplitude, you're looking at the time after you, and so you normalize this thing and then you just look at the decay time. Other questions? So there are, there are other kinds of cavity enhanced techniques. There's this thing called off-axis integrated cavity output spectroscopy. That uses a CW laser and basically any kind of ICOS is just a, a cavity that looks like a Fabry Perot with curved mirrors and you launch light into it and you allow this thing to bounce back and forth a lot and you just average what comes out and you s scan the wavelength. That actually does have ca uh, cavity enhancement in the absorption measurement. Uh, and the reason people typically don't do that is, is that when you get a flame in there, it tends to steer things around and cause noise and so forth, so it doesn't work as well. And, and off-axis, which works better, 
basically has the, uh, the beam walking back and forth through the cavity like that and, and on the mirror it kind of goes around in a circle and you take everything that's coming out. Uh, the problem with that again is, is that you put a flame in there, that's a live lens in the center of the cavity, it, it just messes it up. There is this thing called noise immune cavity enhanced optical heterodyne molecular spectroscopy or nice ohms. Um, this guy, Jan Hall from, J uh, from Jilla, this guy's just amazing. Uh, they get fractional absorptions of 10 to the minus 13. That is like, that's just unbelievable. He, he actually won, he, was, he shared the Nobel Prize for doing this. Um, but you can't put a flame in the center of one of those things, it's just not gonna work. Because this thing has all sorts of feedback controlled cavities, all sorts of fancy feedback controls on cavity lengths and things like that to, to keep control of it so that you can get down to something like that. So it's, it's just a fantastic idea. It's almost a combination. What it really is, is a combination of cavity enhanced absorption plus FM spectroscopy. It's really cool, but it's very hard to do and it would never work in a flame. Okay, laser absorption tomography. So we talked about how a single line of sight uh, going through a complex flow is a big problem. Uh, one way to overcome that is uh, using lots of uh, beams and tomographic inversions. So I'm going to talk to you about work by this guy named Hugh McCann. He's actually my boss at Edinburgh. He's the head of school of engineering at Edinburgh, but he's uh, done a lot of tomography in the past. He used to be uh, at the University of Manchester. And that's a picture of, flu of uh, uh, fuel inside uh, an engine cylinder. So how do you do absorption tomography? Um, you send multiple beams across the sample. So this is meant to represent the sample and maybe there's something here that affects the absorption. Maybe there's more of it there or something like that, right? There's a difference in what they call the path density integral going across that. So we're not going to use Beer's law now. We're going to do something that's equivalent to integrating the equation of radiative transfer without assuming that the path length is uh, uniform. Okay, so for just for one of these paths, we're going to say, look, it's integrated across the path length. There's an n sigma that changes as you go across. And we have to integrate that across the path. So for x-rays, you know, x-rays, you do this all the time. You do x that's what a CAT scan is. It's a, a computer-assisted tomography. Or x -ray, it's x-rays that go around your body and make these measurements. So there's a lot of x-rays that go across. They rotate the source. They get a huge number of these uh, uh, PDIs, just huge. And then they do this data inversion. It's an ill-posed problem, requires iterative procedures, uh, and we don't really have time to talk about that. But the point is, the more of these uh, PDIs you get, the, the better, uh, uh, the higher fidelity, the inversion. So you want lots of angles and lots of PDIs. We're going to show you a couple of examples based on engine research. So this is kind of neat. This is, a, this is an engine head. This is a cartoon of an engine head. They put this thing in here that's like a, a thick head gasket. So this is the engine cylinder right here. And the head, the engine head goes on top of that, so the pistons are coming up and down out of there. If you're not an engine type, maybe that helps. But what was cool is, you look at these, these are pathways for fiber optics, okay? So they were launching diode laser light through these fiber optics into the engine cylinder, and then they were collecting the light with fiber optics and going out to uh, detectors. You clamp the head on this. There's a huge, in, in, the, in the motor world, uh, they don't much like optical engines because you, they like metal engines because you can drive metal engines to full load to the high pressures and high speeds as well. And this is, this is actually an optical measurement in a metal engine which allows you to look at full load and speed. They wanted to look at uh, fuel vapor. So this is the absorption spectrum of the fuel that they were looking at. They can't, because what they wanted was to be able to get a plane they wanted to see a plane of fuel in the engine and they wanted it what, what engine people call cycle resolves, so they wanted to snap snapshots as the cylinder as the piston goes down, right? So what that means is you can't be scanning the wavelength of all these lasers. So what they did is they parked some lasers at uh, 1651, which told you uh, how much was changing in the background. 
Like for example, if I'm, if I'm going to send a beam across the cylinder that's going to measure, that's going to be absorbed by um, something, we want to know how dirty are the windows, how many other things are in there scattering or so forth, right? Well, there's this other beam going with it, which is not being absorbed. And, and if, it, if it goes down in irradiance, that tells you that something was there that was scattering it or the windows are getting dirty or something like that. So that was a way to scale everything. And then, uh, and then they had one at 1700, which is right on the center of the absorption. See, this is typical. You start to get a big molecule like that. The spectrum is not that clean, neat thing we were showing you yesterday. This is really a messy blob, but it's reproducible. Look at this from 10 bar to one bar. It's, it's got a structure, a recognizable structure. It's just not a clean, neat one that's easy to model, like what we were talking about yesterday. So then they, uh, they, they, they do a lot of calculations, they do a lot of modeling, because you can't get as many uh, PDIs as you can with x-rays. So with a lot of modeling, they just said, OK, this is the optimum arrangement for all of these uh, beam paths across the engine cylinder. And as I said, angular coverage is critical. Uh, and you can't fit in, you, you can't just, is that, see that's one big difference between what we study and what some other people study. Not everybody, but a lot of other people who use these techniques have a sample that sits still. You know, like one of us inside a CAT scan machine, right? They tell you to sit still. They keep lecturing you to sit still. Well, you can't do that with an engine, right? So you can't, you can't be doing this with it. So you only get so many passes and so you have to optimize it. This is the very first demonstration they did. So these are crank angle degrees. What that is is the engine crank is going around like that, right? The piston's going up and down. Let's see, can I do it? So, so the crank angle degrees tells you the, the location of the piston, right? And so this is cycle resolved uh, distribution of uh, uh, fuel inside a, a metal cylinder. And this engine was running at 1500 p RPM at a fairly low load. And this was when they uh, actually got it better than it used to be before. So they, they're getting better and better. Here again, we're looking at crank angle degrees. This means crank angle after top dead center. So a negative number means before it got up to top dead center. Uh, so those instantaneous absolute values in a plane of fuel concentration in a direct injected diesel engine. And you can see uh, with a diesel engine, there are lots of sprays that come out sideways. And, and they, the sprays actually come all the way out and hit the wall, which is what you can see here running at 1200 RPM and low load again. So we will now take a break and come back and talk about laser-induced fluorescence.